Hello, welcome to lecture 27 of ELEC Eng 2 ci 5 In this lecture I will go off over some analysis techniques for AC circuits and I will show you that the same concepts we learned for DC circuits do still apply here in AC circuits but the only difference is that all the instead of resistances we have impedances all the quantities we are calculating are complex we have to take into account the, uh, the phase and the uh, magnitude of these complex quantities The first thing to know about AC circuit analysis is that KCL do apply, Kirchhoff current law do apply. We know that from our analysis in the time domain that we know that if you have a circuit like this one where a number of currents meet into one node, we know that the sum of all currents flowing into that node at any time will be equal to zero. But if we have sinusoidal, everything is sinusoidal with single frequency. So all of these currents can be written as real of the corresponding phasor multiplying e to the g omega t. This is the transformation we use it to go from a phasor notation to the time domain notation. And for this to hold at all time, this means that the phasors themselves must add, add to zero. So, and we can, of course, the term, uh, can, the term e to the g omega t will cancel out, uh, and we end up with the, the sum of all the phasor, phasor of currents entering to one node will be equal to zero. Okay, so we can simply state KCL, sum of all current phasors entering into one node will be equal to zero. Sum of all current phasors leaving, leaving one node will be equal to zero. And we can write in the third form of some of them are entering, some are leaving. We can say that the sum of the phasors entering the node will be equal to some of the phasors leaving the node. All of them are equivalent forms for KCL. Here, the only difference is that these are all complex numbers. Each one of them has a magnitude and phase, or it can be written in the form of real and imaginary. And all these complex numbers must, must add up to zero for this equation to be balanced. One other law that still applies here is KVL. KVL still applies for complex, for AC circuits. Here, for example, if you have a source Vs of T, you have a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. We call this voltage here VL, the voltage here V, this VR, this is VL, and this VC. So we can simply say at any time, Vs of T will be equal to VR of T, Z VL plus VL of T plus VC of T. So Vs of T is equal to VR of T plus VL of T plus VC of T. We can, we, this is, this is uh, at any time step, at any time any time this will hold so we can express if we have if this is a sinusoidal source all these quantities are going to be sinusoidals so we can read them we can write them in terms of their corresponding phasors so each one of them will be equal to the real of the phasor e to the g omega t uh, so this is the source phasor this is the vr phasor this is the vl phasor and this is the vc phasor uh, so, and as we agreed before from the previous slide, if this, for this to happen at all time, this means that the complex quantities themselves add up to zero. So this term must be equal to this term plus this term plus this term. And we actually did show that through the differential equations because I've shown you that differential equations themselves do, uh, they can be solved by using a complex response. In other words, a complex response satisfies the differential equation. Now, if you put the, the, the complex form here and get rid of the e to the g omega t, you will end up by, by this balance of phasors. You see that the phasor of the source voltage is equal to the phasor of Vr plus the phasor of Vl plus the phasor of Vc. So this is the statement of KVL, but the statement of KVL for phasors, all these are complex quantities, and but they sum up all, uh, the, the sum, so you can simply say Vs, minus VR tilde minus VL tilde minus VC tilde will be equal to zero. So the sum of all the voltage, the phasor voltage drops around one loop will be equal to zero. Okay, let's take a look at one example. We have here a circuit. Um, it has how many sources? We have a voltage source. We have a voltage source here. We have a current source. This is four angle zero. It's a cosine with amplitude of four angle zero, it's 12 angle 0, 6 angle 0, and uh, the components we have capacitor minus G1 and inductor G2 and so on. The frequency here is not given because all the calculations have been done for us. We know that G omega L is equal to G2 
and 1 over g omega c is equal to minus g1. Uh, we want to apply nodal analysis. Of course, this circuit has how many loops? It has a loop, a second loop, a third loop, a fourth loop. So if you were to do loop analysis, you would require four loops. But if you notice, if you notice, all these points are just one node. So you have one node and ground. So it is it is easier if you use nodal analysis, and then you apply um, the balance of the voltages at this point. Okay. So you simply uh, the balance of the currents at this point. So you simply say the sum of all currents flowing out from this node will be equal to zero. So this current flowing out plus 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 this current flowing out will be equal to zero. So you have how many currents? One, two, three, four, and five. Okay. The current flowing, I've, if I call this point here, um, if I call it the V tilde as a phasor of the voltage here, then we can simply say the current flowing in this branch is V tilde minus 2, 12, ang 12 angle 0 divided by 2. The current flowing out here is this current source for angle 0. The current flowing out here is V tilde minus 6 angle 0 divided by minus G1. The current flowing out here, it's v, it's, the voltage is V tilde to ground, V tilde to ground. Then the current flowing here is V tilde over J2. And the, lastly, the current flowing out here is V tilde divided by 2 ohm. Okay, so we put all these again together. So I call this node here V tilde. It is the same node here relative to ground. And then I said that the sum of this current plus this current plus this current plus this current plus this current will be equal to zero. This current here, the first current is V tilde minus Vs1 divided by R. I call this one Vs1 is 12 angle zero. I is tilde, I is tilde is this current. And this is four angle zero. The current flowing here is V tilde minus Vs2. I call this one Vs2 divided by minus g1 minus it by divided by zc the impedance of the capacitor uh, the current flowing here is v tilde divided by zl which is g20 and the current flowing out here is v tilde divided by r2 which is 2 ohm so what i did what i'm going to do i collect all the terms containing the unknown v tilde all the other terms are are known i know vs tilde vs1 vs1 is 12 angle zero if, if you divide it by two you get six angle zero. So I divide them and then I move it to the right hand side. So all the constants, I move them to the right hand side. I know Vs2, it's six angle zero. I divide it by Zc, which is minus G1. So I move them to the right hand side. And uh, what else do we can move here? So we move Vs, this one here. We move this one. This one here is, is a current source and it is known as four angle zero. So it moves the right hand side by minus I is tilde. So now uh, I collected all the terms containing V tilde. So I get here five terms. Uh, well, let's see, one, two, three, four. Actually, it's four of them because this current does not have V tilde. Four, four terms is equal to these constant terms. And then I substituted. I put R equal to two. Zc is minus G1. Zl is G2. R2 is two. Vs1 tilde is this one here. <coughs> Excuse me. It's 12 angle zero. So I divide 12 angle 0 by 2, we give you 6 angle 0. Vs2 is equal to 6 angle 0. If you divide 6 angle 0 by minus j, remember that minus j is e to the minus j pi over 2. So if you divide 6 angle 0 by e to the minus j pi over 2, this means that you will add to the phase of the numerator pi over 2. This is why I wrote here at 6 angle 90. So this 6 angle 90 is nothing but 6 angle 0 divided by minus g. The last term I added here is uh, the current, this current phasor here, which is four angle zero. Now we start to add them together. Uh, I have one half plus one half is gonna give us one. M minus one over g will give us g, so this is g one. This is one half g, so if you add these two here, so you get uh, one g, one g minus half g, because one over g will give you minus one. So this is G1 minus G1 half. So this is going to give you G1 half. So this is 1 plus G1 half. And on the right hand side, 6 minus 4. Both of them have the same angle. Both of them are real. So this will give us 2 angle 0. 2 angle 0 plus 6 angle 90. So it's 2 plus 6J. Because angle 90 is e to the J pi over 2, which is equal to J.
So I collected all these terms together as I explained in the previous slide. I end up with this. I divide the right hand side by the left by this coefficient to get V tilde. And now we do division of complex numbers in the way we learned in class. Um, the division you obtain, you convert this one first to uh, the polar form. So the, the, the model is here square root of 6 squared plus 2 squared will give us 6.324. The phase is the angle here is the inverse tangent of 6 over 2 will give us 1.249 radian. You do the same for the denominator. The modulus is the square root of 1 squared plus half squared will give you 1.118. The angle is the inverse tangent of 0.5 divided by 1. This will give you 0.4636 radian. So when we divide two complex numbers, we divide the radi radii and we subtract the angles. So this one by this one will be divided. Give, you'll get 5.6565. 1.249, this angle will be sub we subtract from it this angle. Because this one to the, goes to the numerator with a negative angle. So I end up with a total angle of 0.7854. I convert this one to degrees. So I divided this term here by 3.14, which is 1 pi. And then I multiplied by 180. I obtained exactly 45 degrees. So we managed to solve the, the, the nodal voltage V tilde. But V tilde is not the one that was required. We they needed to find the resistance, the current through the resistance R2. But V tilde is the voltage across all the branches. So the current I node through the, the resistance R2, we divide this term here by 2. If you divide the, a complex number by a real number, this means that the modulus will be divided by this real number. So uh, this 5.6565 divided by 2, you get 2.828, and the angle does not change because this 2 is 2 angle 0, so it does not really affect the phase. So the final answer for this one is that the, 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 node, the nodal voltage is 5.6565 angle 45, and the current going through the resistor R2 is simply equal to 2.82 uh, angle 45. Let's consider one more example. Um, we are, this we are given this circuit here, and we are asked to find the voltage V1 through superposition. And we'd like to verify our answer using loop analysis. Uh, so um, superposition, we have to see how many independent sources we have. We have one independent current source. We have a second independent current source. In the same way we did it for DC circuits, uh, when we have current sources, we, we, or we, have, or we use superposition in general, we consider one source at the time, and then we disable the other sources. So if we consider this source, we're going to make this one open circuit. If you consider this source, we're going to make this one open circuit, okay? And once we once you get the answer, we are we will uh, will uh, will will find a voltage. We we'll call it V11. V11 is the V1 due to the first source, and uh, V12 is V1 due to the second source. Okay, so we'll be doing uh, a superposition. I will first consider this source here, and then I will consider this source. So in the beginning, I'm going to remove this one, this open circuit, and then I will solve here for V1 in this case. So I redrew the circuit here after I eliminated the second source, second source now open circuit. I have only one current source. And my target is to find the voltage V11, which is the voltage between this node and ground. Okay, if you take a look at this structure here, or this circuit, you see that we have one impedance in parallel with another impedance. Then the total impedance is the parallel combination. And if I multiply the total impedance by one angle zero, I will end up getting uh, my voltage, a voltage V11 I'm looking for. So first, let's talk about Z1. What is this impedance? You have a resistance in series with G minus, G minus J2. So this will give you 4 minus J2. So this is the first impedance Z1 here, 4 minus J2. Now, the second impedance, this impedance here, you have minus J10, you have J4, you have 2. So if you sum them together, you get 2 minus J6. So Z1 is 4 minus J2, and Z2 is 2 minus J6. Now, the net combination of these two, these are exactly the same way we did for resistances, one branch in parallel with another branch. So we put them in parallel, so the equivalent impedance will be Z1 in parallel with Z2. So it's giving me Z1, Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. This is, the Z1 is 4 minus G2, Z2 is 2 minus G6. Okay, so you, you multiply them in the numerator and you sum them in the denominator. So let's do the summation denominator first. 
4 plus 2 will give us 6, minus j6 minus j2 will give us minus j8. Now, in the numerator, this, this multiplying two terms, you're going to get four terms. Two of them are real, two are imaginary. I will sum first the real. Real by real will give you real, so this will give you 8. Uh, minus j6 and minus j2 will give us minus 12. So this is 8 minus 12 will give us minus 4. For the imaginary part, 2 multiplying by minus j2 will give us minus j4. 4 multiplying by minus j6 will give us minus j24. So minus j4 minus j24 will give us minus j28. So the total impedance is mi minus 4 minus j28 over 6 minus 8j. And I found that I have too many negative signs, so I multiplied by a negative sign in the numerator and denominator. This, this should not make any difference. So this now becomes 4 plus j28 over minus 6 plus j8. Plus j, uh, okay, so now we find the total impedance, the total impedance seen by the source. So I can simply say from this side here, the impedance seen by the source is this, the, the total. So I can simply say that the voltage I'm measuring, which is going to be the voltage between here and here, which is V11, the voltage V1 due to the first source is equal to the current source that we have, which is this current, multiplying by the total impedance. So I'm going to now multiply this term here by one angle zero, and this is going to give me the voltage V11. Before I did the multiplication of, uh, of the current, I converted the impedance for to the... Uh, polar form so I um, this is a modulus of the numerator and this is the angle of the of the numerator this is the modulus of the denominator and because the denominator has a negative real part and the positive imaginary part if you give it to the calculator the calculator will give you this angle which is a negative angle but the negative angle angle is rejected because the negative angle here means you are in the fourth quadrant while when the real the real part is negative, you are actually in the second quadrant. So I added by to the result, and then uh, I divided the two radii. Okay, so this gave me two point eight, and then I subtracted this angle from this angle, which is two point something. I end up with minus point seven eight. So this is a total impedance written in polar form, and then as I said, to get the voltage, I multiplied the total impedance with the current. This is one angle zero. This is 2.8284 uh, angle minus 0.78. So this will give me the same the same value. So this is V11. Now we move to do the second current sources. I removed now the first current source, which was here, and I hooked the second current source. So this one is now open circuit. And now this is how the circuit looks like. Notice that this current is flowing this way. Okay. So if it flew it flew this way, it is gonna create voltages with instantaneous polarity plus minus okay in the same way we had for DC so what I'm gonna be doing right now I will I will use here a current divider I, I, I could have done it in, the, in a way similar to the other one I, I used uh, but uh, what I because I need this voltage here I need the voltage uh, V12 so it's the voltage across this impedance Okay, so the way I did it is that I divided this current into two currents, I1 tilde and I2 tilde through current divider. And then I'm going to multiply I2 tilde by this impedance. And this will give me the negative of V12 because notice the polarity. I2 tilde is flowing this way. So it creates plus and minus. While V1 tilde, V12, which is the voltage V1 due to second source, is positive, negative. So it has opposite polarity. So I use a current divider. If you want to get the current here, if you want to get the current here, then you say it is this current multiplying by this impedance over this impedance plus this impedance. Okay? This one here is minus G10 minus G2 will give us minus G12 plus 4. This one here is 2 plus G4. So the current flowing I2 is equal to this current multiplying Z3, I call this one here Z3, which is 2 plus Z4, and I call this one here Z4, which is uh, 4 minus Z12. Okay, so the current I2 tilde, I'm repeating again, I2 tilde is equal to this current here, okay, multiplying Z4, Z3 over Z3 plus Z4. Simple, simple current multiplication, so I... Um, 
I put the two impedances, this is Z3, this is Z3 plus Z4. If we sum them the denominator, uh, 2 plus 4 will give us 6. G8 minus G12 gives us minus G8. We convert them both to, to, um, to uh, a polar form. So the modulus of this one square root 4 squared plus 2 squared will give us 4.47. The angle is the inverse tangent of 4 over 2. You have the angle here in degrees. I did everything in degrees here because this is given in degrees. Uh, this one here, the modulus square root of 6 squared plus 8 squared will give it 10 exactly. The angle is the inverse tangent of minus 8 over 6. The calculator will give you a, a negative answer, which is a correct answer, because this complex number is in the fourth quadrant. And the fourth quadrant, we can see we have a negative imaginary part and a positive real part, and this indeed corresponds to a negative angle. So what we are going to do, we have now three, two complex numbers in the numerator divided by one complex number in the numerator. So we multiply the modulus by the modulus and then divide by this modulus. We add this angle to this angle and then subtract this angle. If you do that, this is what you'll end up having. So we found the current I2 tilde. And I'm showing you here, this is the current we found, but we are looking for the voltage V12. Notice I2 tilde is flowing from this node to this node. Which, is, which will create a polarity opposite to V12. So this is why when I said I want to calculate V12, I multiplied the, the current I2 tilde with a negative sign with, with, this, with this combination here. This is 4 ohm and this is minus G2. So this is 4 minus G2. So we continue our calculation. The negative sign, I had a negative sign. I counted the negative sign as one angle 180. Because 180 has a cosine of minus 1 and a sine of minus 1. So every time you see a negative sign, you can write it as 1, angle 180. And I put here the current, and then I put here the impedance. Now we multiply the 3 moduli, 1 by 0.22235 by 4.472. Actually, this gives us exactly 1. And then you, saw, you add 180 plus 26.56 minus 26.56, you get 180. So it's one angle 180, which is interesting. So this means that the voltage due to the second source, the voltage V1 due to the second current source, is exactly equal to minus 1 volt. Because angle 180 is e to the minus j pi, which is cosine pi plus j sine pi, which is equal to minus 1. So now that what is the total voltage? Total voltage is V11 plus V12. The voltage V1 is V1 due to the first source plus V1 due to the second source. We got this one from the first source. We just got this one from the second source. If you expand this one here and you sum them, you see that this minus 1 will be subtracted from here. will give you approximately 1, and this will be 2. There is some rounding that happened when I was doing the calculation, but the number is exact. If you use enough digits, you get here 1, and you get here minus J2 volts. So we calculated, and I'm sorry, I have to correct this one here. This is this is uh, what the result we got here is simply uh, V1 is not is not V12. This is the total voltage V1, which is the sum of V1 plus V11 plus V12. So now our next step is to verify this answer using loop analysis, and we're going to use loop analysis in the same way we did it for real numbers. So we have three loops. Um, we have I1, we have I2, we have I3. I use three loop currents. I1, as you can see, is equal to one angle zero. I3, it is 0.5 angle minus 90. And now I, I, will, uh, I, will, I need only one equation to get I2 because I know I1 and I know I3. So I'm going to sum the drops here along this loop. And I'm taking the drop to be positive in the direction of I2. So positive, negative. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay, and I'm going to sum them all in the counterclockwise direction. So I will say the sum of this one plus this drop plus this drop is equal to zero. Well, this drop is equal to I2 minus I3 multiplying 2 plus J4. So this is the first term. Okay, and now I'm going to add plus this drop. But this drop here is equal to I2 minus I1 multiplying 4 minus G2, so this is the second drop. Now the third drop here is simply equal to I2 multiplying minus G10. This is the third drop. So the sum of all these three drops is equal to 0. And you can see I, I, I use the same 
uh, polarities I use for DC. I use the polarities to be positive in the direction of I2, and then I sum them in the counterclockwise direction. So negative, positive, positive, negative, positive, positive, negative, positive, positive. So, there. so I'm summing all these three things. Okay, what I'm gonna do now, I will. I I don't know what's I2. I know I3 and I know I1. So every term multiplying I1, I move it to the right hand side. Every term multiplying I3, I move it to the right-hand side. I keep only the terms multiplying I2. So I2 multiplying 2 plus G4, I2 multiplying 4 minus G2, I2 multiplying minus G10. So this is these are the coefficient. This will this these terms will constitute the coefficient of I2. Now here you get 2 plus G4 multiplying I3. You move it to the right-hand side, and the I3 is 0.5 angle minus 90. Okay, and then you have 4 minus G2 multiplying I1, you move it to the other side, so you get 4 minus G2 multiplying uh, 1 angle 0. Okay, so we sum these terms on the right hand side, we sum these terms here, and we obtain one equation in I in the current I2. And of course, I didn't put a tilde here, but it's understood that all these are phasors. Okay, so sometimes I, I in even many books, you simply ignore the tilde or the bar, whatever. Uh, as long as you understand that this is a phasor, we are dealing with phasors. So we uh, we end up with this equation here: six minus g eight is equal to um, six minus j three. Okay. Uh, so I can solve for i two. I two is six minus g three divided over six minus g eight. With order to do division, we convert them to uh, to polar form. This becomes six point seven zero eight angle minus point four six. This is 10 angle minus 0.927. Uh, if you divide this one, and by the way, these two angles are correct uh, because both these complex numbers are in the fourth quadrant, and the fourth quadrant, the angle is indeed negative between 0 and pi over 2. So this is fine. We subtract them. This will go to the numerator, and uh, so we end up 0.46. So uh, this is what you end up having here. So we got the current I2. So now I would like to calculate uh, the voltage V1, the voltage V1. Uh, I just, I, I draw here for you only the, the branch where I'm going to use to calculate V1. This is V1. In this loop, we had I1. In this loop, we had I2. So I can simply say that V1 is equal to I1 minus I2 multiplying 4 minus G2. And this is what I wrote here. I already know what's I1. I already calculated this. This one is given. Okay. I already have I2, it's 0 0.60, uh, 0 0.6, uh, this term here, 0 0.6708, angle 26. Um, and I did I did combine them together here. You can verify that indeed this is I1 minus I2. And then I multiplied them by 4 minus G2. If you do the multiplication, and I did it using my calculator, you'll see that the answer you're going to get is 1 minus G2, which is exactly the same answer we got using superposition. So regardless of any technique you're going to be using, you should be able to get the same answer as long as you pay close attention to the polarities of the currents and the voltages. One other theorem that still carries on with us from, um, from DC analysis is Thevenin. Looking into any linear circuit, and when you have sinusoidal excitation, you can re looking into the circuit, you can replace the whole circuit regardless of how complicated it is by one Thevenin source and one Thevenin impedance. One Thevenin impedance, and the impedance here in general is complex, and V Thevenin will also be complex. Okay, remember we are dealing with sinusoidal signals. Everything is sinusoidal, and sinusoidals are represented in the frequency domain by phasors. So this will be a phasor. It's a complex number. This also will be the the impedance, which is a complex number. Okay, so we can we can if you have a huge circuit, you can use Thevenin equivalent to replace it by just one complex. Thevenin voltage and one complex impedance in series, and of course we can do that use that to to solve for voltages and currents and so on. The same thing applies to Norton's theorem. Uh, any linear circuit, looking into any linear non linear circuit, you can replace it by a Norton current in parallel with a Norton impedance. This Norton current will be a complex quantity because it's a phasor of a sinusoidal current. And this Z here will be also be a complex number. We can use that to analyze the circuit, find different currents, different voltages, and so on. Let's take a look at one example on uh, Thevenin. In this circuit, you want us to find V naught. 
using Thevenin theorem. So what we're going to be doing here, I will consider this as our load. So 2 ohm is our load. We'll have first to find the input impedance looking into the 2 ohm. So we remove the 2 ohm and then we'll remove all the independent sources. We have here only current sources. So if I remove them, this becomes open circuit, this becomes open circuit, this becomes open circuit. So this, this capacitor is hanging in the air. It's not connected to anything from this side. While here we have 1 in series with 1 in series with J. So between these two no nodes, I can see 2 plus J2. Okay, so this what this is the thing we should consider here is 2 plus J2. This is the input impedance between these two terms. So this is a step I explained earlier. This is the 7 equivalent. I removed all the independent current sources. As you can see, uh, they left lots of gaps in the circuit. And this one here is hanging in the air because there was a current source here. There was a current source here. But the impedance, 7 impedance looking in from these two, between two terminals is 1 plus 1 plus J2 is 2 plus J2. So this is the Thevenin uh, impedance. Now we have to find the Thevenin voltage. So we're going to keep again the circuit, uh, the, the, the remove the 2 ohm, the load, and keep it open circuit, keep the independent sources, and then we'll try to calculate the Thevenin voltage. So I, I, what I did here, I, I removed the load, which is 2 ohm, and I create an open circuit, and V7 will be my open circuit voltage. Um, this circuit, of course, in general, you can, you can say I have three loops. I, I will start to solve for the current using loop analysis. But this circuit is actually simpler than that. Why? Because this is open circuit, so if this is 6 angle 0, so the current here will also be 6 angle 0. But this current is 4 angle 0. 6 angle 0 and 4 angle 0, 6 and 4, if you sum them, they give you this current I2. So I2 is going to be 10 angle 0. Okay, if I know I2, can I get I4? Let's see. I4, if I4 is the current flowing this way, but there are two currents flowing out from this node. This is 4 and this is 4. So this must be 8. Okay, so this must be 8. So I know that this is 8, and I know I2, and I know I1. Can I get I3? Yes. Because you can see I3, I3 is flowing out, I4 is flowing out, and I know it. I1 is flowing out, and I know it. I2 is flowing in, and I know it. So we agreed that I2 is 6, is 10 angle 0. This is 6 angle 0. This one is 8 angle 0. So I can simply say that I2 is equal to I3 plus I1 plus I4, or that I3, which I'm looking for, is equal to I2 minus R4 minus I1. So I2, we already know what's I2. It's 8, it's 10 angle 0. This is 10 angle 0. I know what's I4, it's 8 angle 0. I know what's I1, it's 6 angle 0. Okay, so 10 minus 8 minus 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 uh, the last one i want you six so we're going to go four angle zero so i was able to get all these currents and i can use them to calculate v7 because you see v7 is the voltage between these two points so it's equal to this drop plus this drop plus this drop so if i know i1 i know what is this drop it's one ohm multiplying i1 if I know I2, then I know what is this drop. It's 1 ohm multiplying I2. If I know I3, then I know what is this drop. It is J2 multiplying I3. And this is exactly what I'm going to do here. I said that V7 is I1 by 1 ohm, I2 by 1 ohm, plus I3 by multiplying J2. I1, as we agreed, is given 6 angle 0. I2 is 10 angle 0. I3, we found that it is minus 4 angle 0. is multiplied that by J2. This gives us minus J8. Okay? So you get here 6 plus 10 will give us 16 and give us minus J8. So the Thevenin voltage is 16 minus J8. So now we know what is the Thevenin resistance and we know what is the Thevenin voltage. We can now go back and draw the Thevenin equivalent of the circuit and then we add the 2 ohm resistor again. So, I redrew the circuit again. This is the Thevenin voltage I just calculated. This is the Thevenin resistance I calculated earlier. And this is my load, which is 2 ohm. I'm looking for the voltage V0. Well, the voltage V0 is simply a voltage divider. Because I know it's V7. 
I know what is the load, so it is 16 minus G8 V7N multiplying 2 ohm over 2 ohm plus 2 plus G2. This is going to be my output voltage. Okay, uh, so if I multiply, uh, what I did here in the beginning, I simply, uh, I divided by 2 just to simplify things. So I made this one 1 over 2 plus G1. And then I multiplied 1 by 16 minus G8, you end up by 16 minus G8. And then we start to divide the two complex numbers, uh, take the modulus, the modulus of the numerator, you can calculate it, 17.888. The angle is going to be negative in the fourth quadrant, it's minus 0.463. You do the same here, uh, the modulus will give you 2.236. The angle is inverse tangent of 1 over 1 half, you get this one. You move this one to the, um, of course, when you divide these two complex numbers, uh, you, you divide the two angles and then you uh, subtract the two uh, phases. Okay, so this will give you here point, uh, this, this difference here between these two angles. Uh, so I just comment one last thing that when I, sub I, sub I divide them, it will give me minus 0.463 minus another 0.463. This is going to give me minus 0.92 radian and when I multiply by minus 0.92 radian by 57 degrees uh, because one radian is 57 degrees you obtain minus 53 degrees so this is the output voltage it's a sinusoidal waveform it has an amplitude of 8 and it has a phase of minus 53 degrees so it is shifted in the positive time by 53 degrees okay um, let's take a look at one more example uh, we have here this circuit and we are asked to calculate the voltage uh, V, this voltage here using Norton, Norton theorem. Uh, so the way we do it, as we did in, in DC, circuit, DC circuits, I'm going to consider this one as a load and I'm going to calculate the, thev, the Norton equivalent looking into this load. The Norton resistance is the same as the uh, Norton impedance is the same as the Thevenin impedance. So we can call it, calculate it by creating an open circuit here and then removing all the independent sources. Okay, uh, for the Thevenin, for the uh, Norton current, I will have to create a short circuit here. And when I create a short circuit, uh, I short circuit will be equal to I Norton. So first, the first thing we're going to be doing to calculate the Norton impedance, I will create here an open circuit. So I get rid of the load. I make this one open circuit and I will make this one short circuit. So I created my independent sources and then I will try to find the impedance looking between these two terminals here. So I did this part. I removed the, uh, vo the voltage sources here is now short circuit. The current source that we had here is gone. And this is how the circuit looks like. I would like to calculate Z Norton, which is really Z7. As you can see between these two points, you see Z1 in parallel with Z2. Okay, so an impedance of Z1. Because if you put a source here, the current will split into one current this way and another current this way. So we have Z1 in parallel with Z2. Z1, as you can see, it's 10 minus J10. Z2 are two components in parallel. 5 ohm in parallel with minus J10. So we can find Z2. It's 5 by multiplying minus J10 over 5 minus J10. So this will give us minus J50 over 5 minus J10. Uh, to simplify, I divided by 5 numerator and denominator. This becomes minus J10 over 1 minus 2J. And then what you can do, you can, you can multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. So I multiplied numerator and denominator by 1 plus 2J. So this will give us here in the denominator 5 because it becomes 1 squared plus 2 squared. When you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, you get its modulus squared. So you get 1 squared plus 2 squared, so you get 5. Now, this is minus 10J, you multiply it by 1 plus 2J here, minus J10 by 1 will give you minus J10, minus J10 by 2J will give us 20, because uh, J, with J, J multiplying J is going to give you minus 1. So, um, you get 20 divided by 5, you end up with 4, the other one you get minus J10 divided by 5, you get minus J2. So Z2 is, is, four, is, um, is 4 minus J2. So we, cal we calculated Z1, we calculated Z2, which is this barrel combination. So Z Norton, the Norton impedance or the Thevenin impedance, they are both the same. It is Z1 in parallel with Z2. So we still have to do more complex number calculations. We have to put this one, this term here, in parallel with this one. So we multiply them 
and then we divide by their summation. So we do the Norton impedance calculations, we put them in parallel. So you can see Z1 in parallel with Z2, so we multiply them, and then we divide by their summation. Uh, this will give us 40, this will give us minus 20, so this becomes 20. This will give us minus G40, this will give us minus G20, end up by minus G60. Here we get 14 minus G12, so this is what you have here. You can divide numerator and denominator by 2 just to make things a little bit simpler. So you get here 10 minus G30, and this becomes 7 minus G6, as you can see here. Now to get the Norton impedance, we, um, we take the modulus of the numerator, square root of this one, plus this square root of the square of this one, plus the square of this one, so you end up by this number. Uh, excuse me, the angle is the inverse tangent of minus 30 divided by 10. You get this number in radian. The same thing you do in the denominator, square root of this square plus this square, you end up by this number. The angle is the inverse tangent of minus 6 divided by 7. You get this number, and these two are correct, because these angles are in the fourth quadrant, and these two complex numbers are indeed in the fourth quadrant, because you have positive real part, negative imaginary part. So this is Z Norton. If you divide them, you divide these two, you end up by 3.43. If you subtract the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator, you obtain this one. Uh, so this is the Norton resistance written in polar form and written in Cartesian form. So it is this term multiplying cosine of this one plus j, this term multiplying sine of this one. Then we proceed to find the second part, which is the Norton current. And the Norton current is simply the short circuit current. So we have to remove that, uh, that inductive load and put a short circuit in its place and try to find the current going through it. So this is how the circuit now looks like. Um, it's still, you can see, I just, what the only thing I did here is that I removed the inductor and I shorted it, okay? I shorted between the two, two nodes. So this current here will be the Norton current. I did not touch the, in the, the dependent sources here. Uh, and this Norton current, as you can see, it's sum of two currents, I1 plus I2. Remember, because this is short circuit and this is ground, so this point is ground. So this looks like two, uh, two separate circuits, and we have done that before in, in some examples. So this is, this is ground and this is ground. So I can calculate the current flowing here. I can simply say it is this voltage between this point and ground divided by this impedance. So this is going to give me this current, okay? Because this one equivalent impedance. So the current I2 is even flowing here. This is the same as I2. This is also I2 here, okay? Uh, and I didn't put that, I don't I don't bought the tilde anymore, but understood that all these are phasors, okay? For I1, well, if you, um, if this is ground, if this point here is ground, so you have a current source, this current source will be split into one current here and another current here. So I1, I can obtain it uh, using current division. So it is simply equal to this current, multiplying 10 over 10 minus J10. And you notice the order. I'm, if I need the current in the J10, I, I put this in the, number, in the numerator. So let's do that. I get I1 through current division. I1 is the current flowing here. Remember, this is ground. So these two circuits are separate. So the current flowing here is equal to this current multiplying 10 over 10 minus J10. And this is what I have here. This current, the current of the source is 10 angle 90. 10 angle 90 when you multiply by 100. Remember, angle 90 is equal to J. So you get 100 J divided by 10 minus J10. Okay. So uh, so this is the, the, uh, the current divider. Remember, I, 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 I use 10 in the numerator and then I divide in the denominator by 10 minus J10. So I sum them in the denominator. Okay, uh, this is a little bit big. So I divided both numerator and denominator by 10. So I got 10J over 1 minus J. And then I multiply by the conjugate of the denominator, which is 1 plus J. And this denominator becomes now 2. So this is going to give me minus 10. This term here give me minus 10 divided by 2 will give us minus 5. And 10J divided by 2 will give me 5J. So this is the current I1. Now we need to get I2. I2, the current I2, as I said, is equal to this voltage source divided by this impedance because this is ground here. This impedance is, um, 
is the is the is the parallel combination on five and minus j ten, and we did calculate that earlier actually. If you go back, you will see that's equal to this number here. It is it is four minus j two. We did use it before. It was used before, uh, so it's not it's not something I need to calculate. So um, I I I said that the current flowing here is ten over this this parallel combination, but this is that parallel combination we we calculated earlier. Uh, it is 4 minus G2. So I multiply it numerator and denominator by the conjugate of 4 minus G2. So you get 10 mul multiplying 4 plus G2. The numerator will give me 16 plus 4. So you get 20 here as shown. Okay. So uh, now we divide 10 by 20 will give you 1. Uh, you give 2 in the numerator. So this becomes 2 and this becomes G1. So there is 2 in the numerator here. So now this is the current I1. So I know the current I1. I know the current I2. Then I'm ready to calculate I Norton. I Norton is simply the sum of I1 plus I2. So this is the last step here. I summed I1 and I2. This is I1. This is I2. 2 minus 5 gives minus 3. J plus 5 J will give us 6 J. This ampere. So now we bought the Norton circuit. This is the Norton current we just calculated. This is the Norton impedance we calculated. It's 3.43 angle minus 0.54. And this is the load. The load, remember, was J5. It was an inductor. So we would like to calculate the voltage V. And here, uh, we would like to calculate this voltage. So from the point of view of the source, these two are in parallel, and they represent just one impedance. One impedance of value, J5, multiplying by this impedance over J5 plus this impedance. Okay? We did, again, do this calculation earlier. Uh, this this impedance um, in if you take a look at the previous slide this impedance in Cartesian form is given by this term it's 2.941 minus G1.7646 uh, and then you divide by G5 plus 1 so what I did I, I found the parallel combination of these two and then I said the voltage will be equal to the current multiplying this parallel combination and this is what I did here um, if you combine everything together uh, so J5 will give you 5 angle 90. This one here you can put in its polar form. I believe we had that earlier. So this is the current source. You can put in the polar form 6.708 angle 2.034. I bought this one as well in its polar form. And we have that. We did calculate that earlier. A 3.43 angle minus 0.54. It is this impedance here. And then I combine these two together. So this will give me 2.941 plus uh, J3 point something here. When you take the modulus and the angle, this is what you get. So I have four complex numbers, three in the numerator and one denominator. So the modulus will be this number, multiplying 5, multiplying 3.43, divided by 4.3727. And the angle will be 0 2.034 plus pi over 2, minus 0.54, minus 0.8331, okay? So by doing that, we get the voltage between these two terms. So the last step, I after I collect all this together, I get this modulus for the voltage, this angle, and I could convert this one to radian, and this is what you end up having.